Hello, bent riders around the world. My name is Gary Solomon, and you're watching the Laid Back Bike Report. How great to have you all with us today. Boy, have we had a month of February and a half. Uh, Trey and I have been doing some serious traveling around and uh, shooting lots of video and getting lots of interviews for, later, uh, for uh, things that are coming up later on. We're going to talk about all that uh, later on in the show. But for right now, we're just glad that you're with us. And let me tell you what we have coming up on today's show. We have a boat full of, of people to talk to and interview. And uh, here we go. Well, let's start uh, with uh, Brian Ball, who is with us with the news. He'll be starting off. And then we're going to go to uh, Berlin, Germany, where we have a gentleman named Stuart Moore, who has handmade his own wooden trike. A uh, really interesting build. I think you'll enjoy hearing from Stuart. We'll look at uh, all the uh, ingredients that went into what he did. And then kind of continuing on the home built line, we're going to go to Oklahoma and visit with Robert Barnett. Uh, Robert's an interesting fella who does a number of things. He has built a hand crank pedal system that he has built into a trike and also can be used on uh, all sorts of other uh, bikes, including uprights. So we'll talk about that. And also Robert happens to be the race director uh, for the drag race at Battle Mountain. This is not the main speed record race, but uh, kind of a special race that goes on in the town of Battle Mountain. So we'll talk with Robert about that a little bit later. Uh, another special guest who has been on before, a good friend of the show and a good friend of ours, it's Sylvia Halpern. Uh, as you know, uh, Travels by Trike, Sylvia is in Colombia. Most of you should know that. If not, you know now. And uh, I believe she is in Cartagena. So she will be joining us and we'll talk with her about uh, how her trip has been going so far and a couple of other uh, things, I think, as well. Uh, Denny Voorhees is with us and he's going to give us a sports report. And then uh, what was once the headliner is uh, kind of dropped to the back of the show because uh, Doug Davis is going to talk about uh, Bicycle Evolution, his new shop selling uh, Velomobiles and lots of other bents. Uh, Doug, as is his way, is actually riding his Velomobile right now. He is doing a pack tour in the deserts of Arizona. And uh, I think the schedule kind of got uh, flipped around because of the bad weather out there. So he's going to try to join us, but it's going to be late. So uh, hopefully he'll be with us later on. So we Look forward to talking to Doug as always. Folks, uh, we hope you'll subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, if you uh, look in the lower right-hand corner, right about there, you'll see the uh, Laid Back Bike Report logo. If you click on that, it will take you to the YouTube channel and you can subscribe and there's a little notification bell. Uh, if you click on that, you'll get a notification every time we go live with a video. And uh, in the upper right-hand corner, you're gonna see a little eye pop up that uh, is an indication that you can click and go to our website to find more information out about the laid back bike report. We'll talk more about that uh, at the end of the show as well. Uh, we do a live chat every time we do a live show and we hope that you'll participate. We have a bunch of people on already today. How can you do that? If you're watching on the YouTube page, you can look uh, to uh, the right there and you will see the live chat. You can just type in at the bottom and participate, ask questions, make comments, uh, just chat with your fellow Bent Riders on there if you like. Um, if you're watching on uh, Facebook or Bent Rider or Twitter, uh, you want to uh, click on through to the YouTube page so you can participate and you can just uh, go to the bottom of your screen there where you're watching the little window and you'll see where it says YouTube. Click on that, you'll come uh, right to the YouTube page and you can uh, participate in the live chat there. All right, let me talk a little bit about the very special folks who are the sponsors for the Laid Back Bike Report. Today's show is sponsored by TerraCycle, makers of exquisite recumbent parts and accessories for your bent, and Trailside.Bike, a fine recumbent bike shop on the Withlacoochee Trail in Florida, and Cruise Bike, designed for the cyclist who wants to ride farther, climb faster, and adventure more. All cruise bikes and frame sets ship free in the USA. And Lightning, Lightning Cycles, the aerospace designed and race across America record owning recumbent 
you've always wanted. Okay, folks, uh, let me now introduce you to the fine folks who keep this show running. Uh, my panelists, uh, and they all do an amazing job. Let's uh, let's go out to Salzgitter, Germany, where we find our director. It's Lars Kamm. Hello, Lars. Hi, Gary. Hi, guys. Good to be here. It is great to have you. Let's go on now to Raymond, Mississippi. Uh, my traveling pal, videographer on the road, and our media guy here on the show. Uh, so many things. It's Trey Burgoyne. Hello, everybody. Burgoyne. Thank you. There it is. And let's go to Rochester, New York, where that last sound came from. It's the founder and editor of Bent Rider and our news desk anchor. It's Brian Ball. Hey, hope I don't blow away during the show. <laughs> the wind is blowing. I know. We're glad to have you with us today, Brian. And uh, from uh, Floral City today, uh, his uh, winter home, it's our laid back sports desk anchor, Denny Voorhees. Hello, Denny. Yeah. Yeah, it pays so well. I have a winter home and a summer home. How do, how do you know? Who well, knew? it's, who it's the laid back box report, and I hope you won't uh, spread that around because I'm not paying the other panelists, but please <laughs> don't let them know about We'll that. start something today. All right. And uh, here's another guy that I'm not paying from Cold Spring, Kentucky. It's Larry Varney. Larry, unmute yourself and say hi. Hi, Gary and everybody else. And yes, it's kind of chilly here in Cold Spring, but knowing that brian's on there from rochester i know it's worse up there so we'll just let it go at that but anyway good to see and talk to you all again great larry thank you for being on okay well i think at this point we will uh, go ahead and go uh, back to uh, brian for the uh, news report today brian are you ready to take it away yes i am if you can just pull up the first slide there uh, i don't i don't know what order you're going to do them in so i'm going to take your cue trey as you put them up and uh, there, we, there go. we go. Okay, uh, so uh, this is not a picture of a triad trike, but this is a, a story about triad. They haven't shown pictures of the complete thing. Uh, this is actually the picture they're showing on their site. But triad is going to start doing e assist using the Bosch system. And that's honestly one of my favorite e assist systems. It is very nice, and it is going to come with either the Roloff E14 or the uh, New Vinci Automatic, which is, I think that's going to be a really cool pairing because it's an awesome trike anyway. The suspension system works great. They're extremely well built with all that stuff on it. I assume it's not going to be uh, inexpensive, but it's going to be pretty great. I will know for sure because I'm actually flying out there at the end of this month to go hang out with them for a few days and try one out. And I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. Uh, it's it's going to be a pretty cool system. Uh, next up. Uh, so, uh, this is a ghost Swiss drive that is mounted on an HP Valley Technic. One of their, uh, one of their, uh, uh, yep. Uh, the Pedelec couldn't come with word for a second. One of their Pedelec, uh, trikes, uh, ghost Swiss is no more. Apparently they announced, uh, or mid last month that, uh, they they went into liquidation. There's going to be no more ghost Swiss drives. I did speak to a couple different people who said they are in hopes that someone is going to take it over and they will continue to be available after a short hiatus, but that is right now very, very much up in the air. So uh, that's uh, that's a bit upsetting because, again, that's another great system, especially in the HP Vela Technics. They, they spent a lot of time getting that all integrated, and everything I've heard from everyone, not just HP, it was a pretty big surprise. No one expected that they were going under. Their parent company just decided we're not going to make these anymore, and it was kind of a big shock to everybody. So a lot of companies are scrambling with that. Uh, you want to hit the next one? And lastly, we're sticking with the e assist theme. That's the theme of the news. Uh, again, another small kind of uh, you know hiding some things picture. But if you are on the cruise bike email list, which if you're not, go there and get on that so you can get the insider stuff. They are coming out with an electric version of the cruise bike T50. Uh, all I know is it's gonna be e-assist. There's this picture and there's a smart trainer option. So uh, it's I don't know what system it is. If somebody knows from looking at that particular controller, it's not one that I recognize, uh, but it would be very interesting to see what that comes out with. The T50 is kind of their budget model. So I'd assume it's not a horribly expensive system. And the smart trainer option is, is interesting. So we will look and see. Does anybody here recognize that from looking at that controller? Yeah. I don't think I, so. 
I fully admit I'm still trying to learn all these e-assist systems. They came out of nowhere, and it's a complete re-education for me, definitely trying to learn all these things. But I know it's not a Shimano Steps. I know it's not a Ghost Swiss. I know it's not a Bosch. Not sure what it is. But if you want to know, go to cruisebike.com and sign up for their insider email list. And that's it. And that's it. I was waiting for you to say that's it, but that's it. Thank that's you, it. Brian. That's, uh, that's great. We appreciate that so much. Um, okay, I think uh, right now, let me say hi to a few folks who have come on to the live chat. Uh, our buddy uh, Bob uh, Pelton is there. We see him. Upright Mike, that's Mike Mowat. Uh, hello, Mike. It's good to see you. Uh, let's see, Richard Myers, our friend from uh, here in Ohio. It's good to see you uh, on, uh, Richard. We appreciate it. Uh, let's see, Derek Pyrie from South Africa, one of our uh, contributors. He's uh, He's there uh, building lots of bikes and trikes, I'm sure. Larry Hobbs, uh, greetings from wet and windy South Joyzy, he says. So, uh, hello, Larry. Uh, George Mills, my good buddy here in town. Uh, Velo American, that's, uh, that's Jeff. Uh, hello, Jeff, good to see you. Uh, Ryan228, uh, wow, okay, it's good to see you in Germany there. That's... Uh, that is Joseph. Let's see who else. Uh, Craig, uh, Craig uh, Prather is on. And uh, yeah, I think that's it for right now. So uh, keep putting your comments on there uh, as we go through the show. And uh, if it's uh, pertinent to one of our guests, we will bring that up uh, with a comment or a question. All right. So speaking of guests, let's start with our first one today. Uh, he is in Berlin, Germany. He is not a German but actually someone from New Zealand. A uh, very interesting fellow who contacted me a few months back uh, talking about uh, building a wooden trike. And we're gonna take a look at what he has put together today. Uh, I would like to introduce you all to Stuart Moore. Hello, Stuart. Hello from Berlin, Germany. It is great to have you on today. And uh, we are looking forward to talking about uh, that uh, that trike over your left shoulder there. So uh, let me get a little bit of background first, and then we have some slides uh, showing what you have put together and how you did that. And then we'll chat uh, about all that. So um, Stuart, can you tell us a little bit about your background with bikes? I don't think it's that extensive. Uh, and then tell us how you came to, uh, to decide to do this project. Well, I haven't had uh any sort of dealings with bikes at all really uh i decided to uh make this tricycle out of wood uh based on well i just wanted to do something really i was doing nothing in particular i had my jobs here as a photographer and in the past i'd been a uh, a carpenter so i had been dealing with wood in my professional life as a builder, a carpenter in New Zealand. But when I came to Berlin, Germany, uh, I had a whole new career in photography. So I really wanted to get back and make something out of wood. So what I did was I uh, was looking through YouTube and funny enough, I was looking at boats. There's a guy called Artistic Brit and American Boathead and Paul Alkin, and it was through Paul Alkin's uh, website and his YouTube links that I saw a recumbent tricycle and I thought, oh, wow, maybe I could make something, you know, make a tricycle. But and Paul, no Paul Elkin, by the way, is is uh, has been interviewed on our show before. He's a wonderful guy with lots of great ideas. I didn't know that, uh, that he inspired you. Yeah, Paul Elkin's DIY, I think is the name of his website. He's got lots of great stuff on YouTube. A uh, good friend of the show. So that's interesting. I didn't know that. Go ahead, uh, Stuart. Yeah, because when we talked last time, remember I said I couldn't actually remember, but I went back through my um, Google chat, you know, the, the links, the history, and I saw right back in 2017 that that YouTube links that I was looking at went, oh, yeah, well, that must be how it sort of all started out. And then my memory came back because I couldn't actually remember what, um how i came about this initially when i first talked to you so from paul alkin i saw that and i thought oh i can't do this because i haven't got any welding skills i don't know how to weld so initially i thought well this is going to be quite impossible to do but then i saw a guy called ron out of 
uh, the Netherlands, and he had a, uh, a certain system of um, the steering mechanism where you didn't have to weld at all. So there's actually no welding whatsoever on the tricycle. It's made, the frame is made out of wood, out of pine, uh, 25 millimeters by 25 millimeters. And okay, let's, you um, know what, Stuart, I think uh, that's good enough to get us to the slideshow and we can be more specific now uh, about uh, how you put this all together. So uh, my question, I was gonna ask you why it was you built a trike instead of a bike, because who would have thought of that? But uh, but you've answered that as well, very interesting. So here is the first slide. I think maybe we'll just kind of go through these. Uh, you can tell us about how this build came together. And uh, when you're ready for the next slide, just uh, tell Trey to, to, to go to the next picture and we'll go from there. Okay, so initially when I started off, I had a flat table. And what I did was I made sure that the table was at a certain height that I didn't have to be bending down all the time. So it's, I'm like six foot one. So the actual height of the table is fairly high up. And I thought it was a great idea to be, to have a platform higher up so you don't have to bend down. And I put the three wheels in there. As you see, there's two 20 inch wheels at the front and a, 28 inch wheel at the back these wooden parts on the side hold the wheels together and this was the initial setup of how i'd put the actual frame together um, around the wheels in the center of the table i drew a line um, and i went i got a level and i leveled up uh, you know vertically and then measured off with the frame. If we go to um, number two, photo number two, here we can see this is a look straight down the center of the tricycle. In the middle of the table, there's a line, and I measured straight up, and that way I got the whole balancing act of having actually everything symmetrical either side and allow the frame to actually um, be... Uh, mechanically sound as far as weight distribution goes. Uh, can we go to number two, number three? Here we have uh, the timber <laughs> with a couple of dowels. And when I placed the timber together, I made sure that everything was um, glued together with waterproof glue. And then putting dowels in the wood from one side to the other side. So if we go to the next photograph, we can see the holes. So the dowels go into those holes and then they expand up to the next place that the frame hits and that's all glued and doweled together. If we go to the next photograph, here we can see that the whole frame is placed together and you can see that it's actually quite high. It's actually, uh, 2.3 meters which is like 90 inches so it's actually quite a long tall frame if we go to the next photograph there this is a photograph of the seat well basically that's what i'm trying to show here i went through five different prototypes of seats i had a you know like when you're building something from scratch, and I had really no idea what I was doing other than I had a few skills with uh, timber. So I looked on the internet and I saw a frame that I quite liked and I sort of copied it, but I had to change a few aspects of it. And one of the things that I had to come up with was the seat because I really didn't um, have any idea of what I was really doing as far as actually being uh the type of seat that i wanted so i went through five different prototypes and if we go to the next photograph trey oh thanks uh we can see here that uh, this is the final sort of setup that i finally got to after five different approaches the bottom of it is an old computer seat now I, over here in germany uh, the germans are very good at recycling everything so People often chuck out old uh, computer desks and computer chairs on the street. 
and other people pick them up. So I thought, oh, well, this is a great way of actually utilizing an old computer chair. And it's also got the ski ramp sort of part on the bottom. And uh, that allowed, you know, because there's quite a lot of force pushing when you're actually pedaling, you're actually sort of inclined to move forward. And I thought it was a good way of actually stopping uh, your bottom from actually moving off the seat. Looks like a good idea. Um, Stuart, we have a comment from uh, Mike Mowat uh, say, just uh, talking about woodworking, saying it's amazing what can be done with wood. It's an art slowly being lost. People built out of wood for so long, and now next to nothing is built from wood. So interesting that you're doing this and uh, in such an interesting way as well. Okay, if we go to the next photograph, here we have the idea behind how I was going to hold the actual structure together. If we go to the first one there, you can see that it's just a normal frame. So you've got the dowels holding the timber together and the PVA glue. The next one is hemp. Now I wrap the hemp around the frame. The next one is the hemp and carbon fiber. I actually found that it was a complete waste of time using the carbon fiber. And if I was ever to do it again, I just wouldn't use it at all. Uh, I got massive amount of splinters in my fingers when I was sanding it, when I was putting it on. And it seemed to me that I'd never used carbon fiber before. And the whole over-engineering, because I was actually told by someone, don't over-engineer it. And what did I do? Well, I over-engineered it. So the carbon fiber was a complete waste of time. What I should really have done is just wrapped it in hemp and maybe two, two wrappings. And then if we look at the last one, we can see that I wrapped it with uh, rope. If we go to the next photograph, here we have uh, the process of the very first wrapping of hemp. So I cut off long strands of hemp and they came in bundles of like 10 meters long. I must have went for about four or five of them over the total frame. The next photograph, please. Here we have the hemp and the carbon fiber. That's epoxy there. And I use toolcraft epoxy. Uh, you know, I know there's West systems and, you know, various other ones. But for me, I only really had one bad batch of epoxy and the whole entire frame. Uh, and that was due to the brush I was using as opposed to the actual uh, epoxy itself. Next photograph, please. So this is the final product that we get. We've got one wrapping of hemp, then we've got a wrapping of carbon fiber, then another wrapping of hemp again. And that's the basic you know, look of it as it, it doesn't look very inviting at all. And I did a little bit of sanding, not a lot of sanding. And if we go to the next photo, we can see that we've got the wrapping on the bottom of the hemp, the carbon fiber and the hemp, but at the top there, we have the rope wrapped around to hold everything to the other. Realistically, the rope is just aesthetic look as opposed to anything structural or you know any other purpose at all. It's really just aesthetically supposed to be pleasing. And I was reasonably happy with the final result. Um, I could. You know, Stuart, it looks to me like uh, it, it does make it look nicer. It covers over all of your uh, your work attaching everything together. It might make someone look at that. Someone who looked at that might just think it's being held together by string. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> which is a simple but probably not very effective approach. No, it would sort of sort of fall apart. I think. Yeah, quite easily. But anyway, very nice. All right. So the next photograph. Here we have some of the middle parts that were used to connect everything together. Uh, the next photo. Here we have the steering mechanism. Now, because like I said before that I couldn't weld, and from what I gather, you know, if you're making a middle frame, you really need to weld. But with the system, you didn't need to have um, any of those tools. All you needed is a drill and a file. And basically, you could create this 
turning mechanism for the trike. Now, granted, you know, all these name brands like Terra Trike and HP and Cat Trike, they've got a turning radius between like 4.6 to, you know, 4.2 or whatever. But my turning radius is like 7.2. But I was thinking the other day about this and that when I'm on my bicycle, I go to A to B to C, I hardly ever turn around and go back from where I'm. So as far as I'm concerned, I won't be actually doing a 360 or even doing a 180. I'll be hardly ever sort of going back on myself. Yeah, Stuart, I think maybe you're being a little too hard on yourself. I mean, this is your first trike build, and uh, that's a very small compromise, I think, to make to have something that looks and works as well as this obviously does. Okay, so if we go to the next photograph, here's another side profile of the turning mechanism. And I was very, very happy with the Archie Storm Stormy Archer uh, 90 millimeter drum brakes with the wheels. And I think it was probably, you know, it was a very expensive buy for the, the whole build, but I'm really happy that I use the actual drum brakes because I've had no problems whatsoever. And I, I have this real sense that if I was going any particular speed, at, <laughs> um, you know, over 30 kilometers an hour, that I could pull up and stop very quickly. Uh, let's photograph. This is the front mechanism. What I did is I uh, took off uh, the paint from the shaft there and then put two different pieces of uh, wood on either side and epoxied. If you can see that sort of shiny, yellowy substance in the middle there, uh, that's epoxy, yeah, right where the uh, cursor is right there. That's epoxy. And I've epoxied the whole thing and then wrapped it in um, one sort of wrapping of hemp and then rope around it. And actually that holds very well together and I've had no problems. There's a little bit of movement side to side, but other than that, it's worked out very well. I epoxied the whole thing down onto the frame. Next photograph, please. Uh, the idlers were going to cost me 60 euro each. So I thought, oh, well, you know, I don't really want to spend that amount of money. So I decided to make them myself, and that's what I came up with. I uh, got some decent, you know, a couple millimeter thick uh, plastic there, and then some little uh, gearing mechanisms in the middle and a bolt through it. The only real problem that I've had with this trike, oh, we had a few slight problems with other areas but the only problems i've really had is with these idlers and it's not actually the idler that what you've seen on screen itself it's actually the mechanism to hold them in place because there's actually a lot of pressure from the chain when you're you know putting your pedals around and the chain going across these things the actual mechanisms failed twice and the third time now i've taken the trike out three times and basically they're holding together now, and I'm quite happy with the way they're holding together. But I had a lot of trouble holding these particular idlers in place on the test tries that I had. Next photograph, please. This is basically a view. As you can see, I initially had under, um, under seat steering, but uh at the last minute you know like at the ninth hour or whatever it is i had to change my mind about it because the mechanism that you can see on screen there wasn't really working out and the ball bearing and the whole mechanism underneath the seat was it just wasn't working for me and i i felt as though i needed to actually do something different so i put the actual handlebars on the side of the steering mechanism and sort of had it more direct connection with the wheel that way. Next photograph. And this is sort of pretty much close to the final product of what it actually looks like now. And I th is that the last one? Uh, there's one more, but that's oh, on sorry. the other side. Yeah. yeah. Very, very nice. Let's go back to Stuart if we could. Uh... Lars, and you can actually see uh, 
like I said, over your shoulder, there it is, huh? Yep. So now tell me, you've, you've ridden it, uh, I think last time I talked to you had been a couple times, now you've ridden it three times. Tell me, are you satisfied with what you've done? Are you going to be doing some more tinkering? What's the status of it? Uh, it's quite a tough question to ask because this is the first time that I've actually ever sat down on a tricycle. Before that, I'd never ridden one. I'd only seen them in the shops. So I'd never actually ridden one before. Uh, I like it. Uh, I think that if I was ever to do it again, I would do a similar type of frame, but I wouldn't use epoxy. I would use uh, polyurethane glue, and I would probably use some oak instead of pine. And I would change one or two things about it. I definitely, I think, that putting some sort of electric motor in it would be beneficial going up hills because I found that, like, your lead's really strained going up hills. And, I mean, I know that's, you know. Yeah, that's to be expected, I think. But, you know, me, George, George Mills has asked, uh, I think this will fit right in here, about uh, the weight. Do you have any idea what this, uh, what this weighs? I have no idea. Okay, I thought maybe you did. That's uh, one thing that. Really, the only one thing that I don't know, I don't know the way. But okay. I will say this, that it actually runs very smoothly. I think it's reasonably heavy because the seat's quite heavy. The metal on it are quite heavy. And I've got a 20-inch 20 20 inch wheel at the back and two 20-inch wheels at the front. The frame itself is actually quite light, but everything else is actually reasonably quite heavy. All right, let's kind of finish up with, uh, Mike Mount has asked another interesting question. Uh, has Stuart built any of the guitars we see in the background of his shop? Curious, as some other recumbent home builders, such as John Morsig Morsiglio, have also built guitars with their same skills. Have you tried that? When I was 16, I built my first guitar and it was a complete disaster. My father helped me and it sounded absolutely terrible. And from that time, I built about one 12 string guitar and a couple electric guitars. Uh, I built the uh, square shaped guitar that I don't know if people will see that, but sometimes it pops up in the flicker links. So it's more sort of like a bow diddly square type shaped guitar. I used an old refrigerator uh, front panel for the uh, freezer box. And it was made out of plastic and it had a design on it and everything like that. So, Anyways, those skills do, to some extent, transfer, obviously. You use some of that to, to build the track. I think that's amazing, uh, Stuart. I'm very impressed with what you've done. Let me, uh, let's me let wrap it up here. I want to know, uh, will you in, do you intend to, to ride this uh, routinely? Is this going to be... Your, your trike to ride, uh, you know, uh, for, for pleasure? Are you going to think about commuting or what, what would you do with this trike? I definitely just want to use it on, like on, on Sundays to, you know, travel out because I find myself like on my normal push bike, I'll do between 80 and 100 kilometers on a Sunday. I'll just go. I just really love cycling. That's the thing. And with the trike, if I can get out there on that, and have some sort of um, uh, electric motor on the back of it just to help out with the hills, I'll be really satisfied. I really like the actual laid back aspect of it. Uh -huh. And being close to the ground, you have the sense of um, speed. I, I don't know. It seems faster for some reason, even though it's probably a lot of bits slower than a normal push bike but because you're closer to the ground you have a more sense of a speed and um, yeah all of our viewers who have ridden a trike i think will attest to that feeling exactly that you have this sense of speed anyways and i think it is because of the uh, proximity to the ground perhaps but in any case i'm glad uh, i'm glad you had uh, the time to put something like that together it's a very interesting build and i i hope uh, our viewers enjoyed uh, seeing how you did that uh any final uh, thoughts on uh, on all this how um, I guess, uh, final thoughts, and, and how can people get a hold of you if they want to ask questions of you? Well, if they want to get hold of me, they can get hold of me through uh, uh, Google, 
in my account, like uh, Berlin recumbent at uh, googlemail.com. Gmail.com. And I'll, I'll post that so that people can see that if you like. And there's a Flickr account where I start from the very start and a whole series of photos going through. There's actually some YouTube uh, videos there. They're not very good, but, you know, it gives you an idea. And also when I was doing the epoxy and hemp uh, situation of putting the frame together with that those substances, that... Uh, there's a whole video on that so that you can see the actual process that I went through on creating that sort of side of things and holding the frame together. Very good. So I'll make sure to post the, the email and your, uh, your, um, your, um, it's your YouTube uh, channel, I think is what we're talking about there. So very good. Stuart, thank you so much for, uh, for much taking for the time me. to come on the laid back back report. Please stick around if you like and, uh, and watch the rest of the show unless you have to go. And we appreciate it. We'll talk again soon. Okay. Thanks, Stuart. Thank and great, great. All right. Let's move along to our next guest. Um, I uh, mentioned him earlier in, th in the uh, in the introduction to the show. Uh, this gentleman is in Oklahoma, a very handy guy also, has lots of interesting ideas. I think we're going to jump right into our talk. Uh, I'd like you all to meet Robert Barnett. Hello, Robert. Hello, glad to see everybody. Yeah, it's good to have you with us, uh, sitting in your shop there. Uh, Robert, can you tell us uh, briefly uh, about your background with bikes? I think it is rather extensive, but uh, briefly, how did you get into uh, uh, biking at all? And uh, and, and uh, where are you now with, uh, with biking? Well, when I started, I started out as a child. Uh, I would uh, scavenge all my all my neighbors' kids would get all new bikes, and they'd always tear them up. And I'd scavenge in the parks and build my own bikes out of them. That's how I got into biking. Uh, professionally, I'm a prototype machinist. I build inventions for inventors and new products for many different industries. Okay, well, that gets you a great background, obviously, to do what you do. Let's talk about that. So. Um, where did you get the idea? What was the inspiration for, uh, this, this pedaling system that we're going to talk about? I was a uh, gymnast and also did Olympic lifting and quite a few other sports that involved your upper body. Uh, always rode bikes with no hands. It was kind of one of my expertise. I could corner and stuff without even using my hands. And I always wanted to put that power into it from my upper body. So I started inventing my own arm and leg powered bikes. All right. And that's going to bring us, I think, to uh, our slides. And we're going to start talking about uh, how you did that. Um, if we can uh, get that first slide up. Is that the first one? Yes. These are oh, uh, go some, ahead. Of my, some of my early attempts. Uh, the top left is a uh, trike that I used uh, levers and a hand twisting mechanism. And then the next one I built my first... Uh, hand crank top right and uh, absolutely impossible to drive you see the training wheels on there <laughs> this uh if the yellow one there is a uh, rear steer arm and leg powered bike i actually took that one to battle mountain one time uh, then i started uh doing the uh trail mate bikes uh, you see the two guys riding them there with the wings on them i actually built two identical bikes we took them to thunder valley drag strip and we had different people race them that I, I had 14 different designs for I settled in on something that really worked well. And that's what we're going to start talking about now. Yeah, let's move All on right. to the next one. This was one of my first recumbents. It was a Burley. And uh, riding it, it had a pivot point, And I was, <clears throat> you know, you could push the handlebars forward and bring them back. So I thought, well, you know, if I could bench press and row this thing, I could make pretty good power. So I uh, invented a uh, transmission mechanism where I could uh, actually uh, use my arms in this. And, and you go ahead and tell Trey when you're ready for the next slide. Yeah, the way, okay. This is um, where I actually took it to uh, Canada at the Human Powered Speed Challenge in, in 2002 and uh, raced it there. And uh, in this particular race, you can see this uh, hill in the back there where there's a bridge. 
going over that, when we started going in uphill, I was easily uh, able to pass Bill Murray there on the hill. And then after that, I was going too fast and crashed it around the next turn. <laughs> but I also, I also took one of my arm and leg power trikes there, which I won a gold medal in the drag race. Uh, the beginning of the drag races, huh? Uh-huh. That was, uh, well, after, you- after building a few trikes, I figured out these things accelerated really quickly. and, and yeah, We're going to see was, some of that here shortly, I, I think. So I started looking for places I actually, actually could go race. So this was one of them. Uh, this is starting to build my dragster that I take to uh, Battle Mountain. I've taken it for many years. This this frame was actually built by SND Recumbent in Compton, California. The frame set was, and, and I've had it painted to match my old pickup there. And then you can this is the rebuild on it. It was re- originally uh, lipstick red, and uh, then I had it painted this burgundy color. Go to the next slide. These are some of the uh, components after being machined. I, I work with aluminum and titanium and stainless steel, chrome and a little bit of everything in there. And uh, <clears throat> this is the year that um, Graham Obery came to Battle Mountain when I was doing this. And uh, he was working on his bike in the kitchen, grinding on something. So I threw a few kitchen utensils in there and bolted a piece of titanium on the back of it. and. Got some sparks flying. So, all right. Uh, this is actually goes to a different bike. This is my patent pending auto reversing transmission I use on my arm and leg powered bikes. I've built about half a dozen of these so far. This is a uh, Cannondale. The, the The goal all along is to build upright bikes. You could use your arms on. That's very difficult. Um, this one uses one pull pull one push pull cable to transmit power to the transmission, which drives your uh, foot crank, which meaning your upper body body and lower body are always in sync with each other. Uh, when you turn your pedals, it will not move the handlebars, but anytime you move the handlebars, it automatically engages forward pushing or pulling, and allows you to put power into it. Upright bikes, you're not in a really good ergonomic position to make power with your upper body though, but it does help a bunch going uphill. It is faster. This is a chain, one of my early chain drive versions okay. where, where it uses a chain. And uh, this is a close up of the uh, auto reversing transmission. This is patent pending. Very good. This is installed on a... How long did it take you to come up with that mechanism? Uh, many years. I thought. It, it's years. not like something you just sat down and threw together. So. Right. And a lot of different prototypes. I mean, so... And yeah, it, yes, there's it, been many prototypes. And so, And when you say it's patent pending, uh, Robert, uh, do you have you pretty much settled on the design now? Is this pretty much what it's going to be? Um, you're always evolving. Okay. But the uh, patent will cover many of these. Okay. This is this is the on and off switch on the handlebars. Um, whenever you lock this, you can push it with your thumb and it's locked. And uh, your handlebars lock into position, so the bike and the and you can pedal backwards and the bike operates normally. Everything just like a regular bike. But whenever you flip that switch, you can push forward or pull back to make power. And uh, and there's no limit to the range of motion on here. You can pull this push it as far forward or as far back as you want to. Very good. It really works well. Here's another picture of that same bike. Okay, continue. This is on a track. This is one of my uh, trikes that I built. And uh, the uh, auto-reversing transmission is built into the bottom bracket here. And this one's chain drive. The, the next bike I want to build We'll have uh, everything underneath it. It'll have the under under seat steering. I'm going to be looking for a uh, lightweight trike to buy and uh, bring it to Battle Mountain this year and race it with uh, one of my uh, arm-powered mechanisms on it. So if there are any uh, bike manufacturers out there that would like to see their bike raced at Battle Mountain with one of my arm-powered mechanisms on it, contact me. There you go, folks. I hope somebody's <laughs> listening there. Let's go to the next one. Okay. 
Because you have another trike that uh, this is a Delta, right? That you built. This yes. Into this, it. No, well, this, this is my dragster I use at Battle Mountain. Everybody take a look. And Trey, you go ahead and let that go a couple times so people get a look at this again. Watch what it looks like when he starts out. <laughs> you get that front end pretty far up in the air. Yeah, you can you can make a lot of a uh, lot of torque when you All get right. your whole, whole body involved. And I think the next pick actually is a will freeze that action uh, tray. There you go. So that's yeah, that that's, is a, an amazing shot. So that's on another day. You know, I rode that bike for many years before I was able to develop enough strength for myself to be able to get that front wheel off the ground. It was very difficult. And, and testing parts that would hold up to that too. Uh, right. Actually we got built. a comment here, uh, Robert, from uh, our friend Susan Straley, uh, okay. who says, ooh, I have been wanting an attachment for the Cat Trite Expedition to do hand crank. This is interesting. So <laughs> thank you, Susan, for that. Uh, let's, uh, we'll see if, uh, unfortunately, Susan doesn't actually own Cat Trike, but um, <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe uh, Mark uh, is listening. We'll see. Go ahead. Let's go to the next one here. This is a truck I drove out to Battle Mountain for many years. It was yellow at first. This was about, this was our drag race central. But, you know, going to Battle Mountain is not just Battle Mountain. It's getting there, getting all your stuff there. And it's quite a drive from here. And it's, it's a journey. And, you know, you're there all week, too. So it's quite an adventure. Okay, and this uh, this part of uh, the interview uh, with Robert now is going to talk more about Battle Mountain and what he does there, which is a little different than what you uh, might expect. This gentleman in the picture here, Robert, you tell us about who that is. This is this more is, the typical Battle Mountain that you're thinking of. Yes, this is Todd Reichardt. He's the fastest man in the world now at uh, over 89 miles an hour. And this was right after he made that run at at the track. University of Toronto, I believe. Yes, and uh, almost 90 miles an hour, isn't that right? Right, 89, 89.65, I think, somewhere right in there. All right, okay. And, but uh, that's not what Robert does there. This is the this, this is the street that Battle Mountain has given us to use for the drag race. This street has been professionally surveyed. I have pins in there. It's, per, you know, almost perfectly flat. It's, we have enough room. We don't have enough room to run like an eighth of a mile. It's we have the first two blocks there we did tenth of a mile for uh, a few years and last year i shortened it to one sixteenth of a mile and i'll explain why here in a minute but it's, it's a really nice track and it is, has been professionally surveyed and i do have timing equipment that's good to a thousandth of a second we also set the timing system up in the uh, civic center where they do the show and tell and they bring all the school kids through and we let them run a foot race through the drag strip i so set up a 10-foot drag race and uh give them a time slip and uh, that's a lot of fun this is at the race this is my wife linda she's uh racing me that right there and uh <clears throat> this is scout He's been our fastest contestant so far. <laughs> this muscle power, I mean. Yeah, yeah. Um, Not recumbent, so but someone, he's still running. That's yeah, it. well, he's all fours. He's arm That's and right. legs. So. Yeah. Four-wheel drive <laughs> yeah, kind of. Right. Uh, he's a quad recumbent. He the, is a quad. That's the, right. The scout's owner trained him to run the drag strip. So this is uh, Matt Weaver's the, the dad, Dr. Weaver. And he's come and helped me for many years do this. He's 80 years old, and that's him out there racing when he's over 80 years old. Uh, this is a race that anyone can come and participate in. We've had ages from five years old to 80, oh, well over 80. So it's a lot of fun, and anyone's welcome to bring just about anything that's human-powered. We have had electrics in the past, but we put them in a different class. You know, uh, Robert, I've got a comment here from uh, Mike Mowat saying, I've seen Robert do this in front, uh, do this front wheel takeoff at Battle Mountain. He is very impressive. You've got a fan there, apparently. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Um, <laughs> Go ahead. Always, always impressed with what he does, too. So. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> but, uh, Next pick, this, I think, huh? Okay. Let's see what we got. This is Will. He came all the way from England and raced for me one year. He drove my bike that year. And 
that's the fastest my truck's ever gone down the drag strip. So <laughs> it's a good, a good racer. And um, I have niece, nieces and nephews that uh, ride with me quite a bit, and they come over and ride my bikes. And we uh, we have a park pretty close by that's really nice, has nice trails. And we ride over there and ride around the trails, and they play on the stuff there. And this is Thunder Valley Raceway, my local drag strip. Uh, this year, when I went to Battle Mountain and uh, raced Ishti Amateur, he, I beat him when I raced him. He was on a, a trike, but uh, he we go by the fastest run. So, uh, Robert, actually, tell everybody who Ishti is and what he's done. He is the fastest junior at Battle Mountain. So uh, he's a pretty good athlete. He's a good competitor. That's right. He is. Yeah. He. It was great to have out there and racing my race. He ra he raced a whole bunch of different bikes. I think he tried to drive everybody's bike that was out there. And uh, <laughs> but one of his runs was uh, five thousandths of a second faster than mine. And we got kind of got mixed up about who was riding what bike. And I had to come back and say I didn't win it. Ishti won it. So so I went to Thunder Valley Raceway and uh, made a run down the drag strip to get a uh, time slip. And uh, if you can see my hat here, it's uh, yeah, let's go ahead and yeah. uh, uh, if you could, uh, Lars, go ahead and uh, pop Robert on the screen. I think that's the last yeah. slide, anyway. Okay, yeah, go ahead and okay. show the hat. Talk about hats because people may not yeah. know what that means. All right, Battle in Battle Mountain, you get like a 50 mile an hour hat or a 60 mile an hour hat or you know, 80. No one's got the 90 mile an hour hat yet, and only a handful of people have gone over 80. But this year at the drag strip, we are going to have hats, and it'll have your fastest speed on it, and it'll be signed by a race official. I got mine at Thunder Valley Raceway this year. If anyone wants to go to their local, local drag strip, make a run down the track, you'll get a time for the 116th mile. And if you bring that to Battle Mountain, I'll uh, give you a hat and sign it. But uh, that's what we're going to give out this year, our hats. So you'll, you'll be able to earn a hat. But only one person in the world will have the fastest hat at any one time because there's only one fastest speed. So that I'm really looking it. forward forward to that. So very good. All right, you know, um, the, <laughs> I want to thank you. And as we segue into our next guest, I've got a little something I want to see if I can show this to everybody here. Let's try this. Yeah, let me go back. Um, there's only one other trike that I know that uh, pops up in the air like yours, uh, Robert, and uh, may actually be faster than you. Uh, and I'm going to share my screen with the folks now and uh, show you what, what that is. There it is. Front end up in the air. Can everybody see that? Yeah. Try. yeah, that is going to be our next guest. So I am going to stop sharing, coming back to me. Okay. And I am going to thank you, Robert, so much for uh, spending the time to put this together with me and to share your uh, and to share your thoughts with us about the trikes and Battle Mountain. Did you have any final thoughts? I uh, just hope this year is going to be great. If anyone wants to come out and race in the drag race, everyone's welcome. All the all the contestants at Battle Mountain are welcome to come race in the race and come come get a hat. Very good. And I know you're on Facebook. I'm going to put uh, you can you can be found on Facebook. I'll put the information yep. uh, below in the description so people can get a hold of you if they want to find more information out. Robert, thank you so much for coming on the Layback Bike Report. Thanks for having me. Very good. Okay. Yep. Uh, front wheels up in the air only sometime. But I think uh, we're going to talk to uh, Sylvia now. Let's see if we can go to Columbia. Can we go to Columbia? Come in, Columbia. Sylvia. Hey, everybody. Hello There's from Steve. Cartagena. Lovely, beautiful, colorful Cartagena. Can you, uh, can Sylvia, you hear me okay? We are, yeah, we can hear you fine. It's a, it's a little slow, but we can hear you just fine. Sometimes, as you folks know, Sylvia's been on the show before, and she's not always someplace where the uh, bandwidth is great. But we hear you fine. So let's go ahead. Uh, and uh, get on with uh, with the chat here, and we're going to find out a lot more about what you've been up to. So uh, let's talk about that. This tour to Columbia, can you give us a little background on when it started and uh, why you decided to go to Columbia? 
Yeah, you know, this fast tour has been just completely different from any tour that I have done in the past. Um, I, I mean, I actually picked Colombia. First of all, I've never been to South America. Um, but the real reason was I really want to learn more Spanish because I want to spend more time traveling in Spanish speaking countries. And the Spanish in Colombia is much clearer. It's much slower and it's much easier to understand. And I figured it would be easier to learn it as well. And so I uh, started, I flew from Los Angeles um, you can see how I packed up my trike and I flew Yeah, let's to go ahead Canada. and uh, let's go to the slideshow if we could, guys. Thank you. Go ahead, Sylvia. Yeah, so you can see how I um, packed it up. You know, I just roll it right to the check-in counter. I always make sure that anything that has grease on it is covered, uh, mostly because I just it would just make me very upset if I got my luggage back and it had grease on it. It's also much nicer for the baggage handlers. I think they really appreciate it. It's not something that's required. Um, but the thing that's really great about the trike is that it rolls just by lifting the rear wheel. And, you know, I'll show the airline guys, you know, they come and they look at it and they're like, well, and then I show them how easy it is to steer it. And oh my gosh, they get the biggest smile on their face. And they're like, oh, of course, this is just not even a big deal. And they just take it away. And so, um, I flew to Bogota and I studied Spanish there for a month. Bogota is at 9,000 feet in elevation, so it took a little while to get used to that. And I lived with a family um, while I studied Spanish for a month. Um, I don't know, is there any pictures from I don't know Bogota that we have pictures or? from Bogota. Let's go. Um, I, I, we're going to talk about the highlights of your trip, and I think maybe we'll just kind of page through this. Uh, this uh, is one of your beautiful uh, shots from your drone, which I know you've used a lot. Tell us, uh, as yeah. you travel through the country, you can give us the highlights so far. Tell us the best places you've you've visited, and tell us about how you use that drone in, uh, in, in sharing your experience there. You know, I'm always looking for... Um, a, a place to use the drone. I, Columbia is probably the most beautiful place that I've ever been. Um, sometimes towns aren't all that beautiful, but the, the riding in between the towns has just been spectacular. And particularly when I left Bogota and I was riding through the mountains through an area called Boyacá and every town, oh my gosh, it was just incredible. And a lot of the towns, like you can see in this picture, they have a central plaza and so it's just a nice open space and then I can put the drone up and I can, I like to be able to see the drone and, you know, just do a quick uh, flight round. You know, Sylvia, I, I might say that um, you, uh, we see lots of beautiful structures of the towns and stuff that you fly over. But one of the things that really strikes me from this trip, especially, are the colors, the, the, the roofs and the building colors are so striking. Do you find that as well? Yeah, it's such a colorful, colorful country. And, um, you know, I, it's, it's just been such an interesting tour. You know, originally when I started this tour, I was going to ride in Colombia and Ecuador. And, you know, in all of my previous tours, I've typically had a starting and an ending point. And I started riding through the mountains of Colombia and it was, you know, it was just, it just takes me so long. And I kind of got through the mountains and it was incredibly beautiful, but like Ecuador has more climbing than Colombia. And I just thought, huh, I wonder, do I really want to make that? Maybe I should make that part of my next tour. And so what was meant was I've just really slowed it down. Um, I decided just to make this tour about Colombia and pretty much every place I've been, I've been for at least two nights. And it has been fantastic. I feel like I have a better relationship with each town. I can remember the towns better. And, um, you know, it's just given me a much richer experience. All right. Let's go ahead to the next slide, guys. And let's talk about a couple of issues that you might have encountered. This is you talk about this type of thing a lot. What, what is this shower head oh. thing? What's it about? Oh, my gosh. It's just the funniest thing. It's like in Colombia... Typically, there is no shower head. You know, it's like showering with a garden hose where, you know, there's just a pipe coming out of the wall and there's just this, you know, flow of water. Um, it's very rare that there's hot water. Like, 
you have to pay extra. You have to be in probably a four or maybe even a five star hotel before you'll get hot water. So that's always a consideration. And you can always tell if there's hot water because there's going to be two taps, you know, two knobs to turn. But typically you go to the, you know, you go into the bathroom and there's just one and you're like, oh no, not again. Anything so else that might shower. be missing from the bathroom occasionally as well? Oh my gosh. And then there's the toilet seat. It's like, it's like most of the time the toilet seat is missing as well. I don't know what the deal is with toilet seats. It's the same in Mexico. I don't know if people steal them or maybe they break and they just don't get replaced. But yeah, it's, it's an issue. Yeah. And so in this picture, you can see there's a, a shower head. It was such novelty. I had to take a photo. Wonderful. Next picture. Let's see what else we got. Have you eaten at all since you've been in Colombia? <laughs> yeah, it's been really nice. You know, uh, interestingly enough, the food in Colombia is not spicy at all. They don't even, they don't even use pepper. And um, uh, the soups are my favorites. They're very tasty. A lot of vegetable soups, maybe some chicken. Um, but it's yeah, it's been just really, really wonderful. And of course, the fruits are phenomenal. I'm, you know, practically on the equator, and so there's just fruit everywhere. It's been really, really amazing. Okay, next one. And you've met a few people and had a couple of interesting yeah. encounters. Uh, talk about that. Tell us about the people that you've met. Yeah, you know, the Colombians are very, very friendly, and the cycling is very popular here, and so. I mean, all day, every day, people are just waving and honking and yelling and asking me to stop to get a photo. I mean, I feel like it's just been a big parade every day. And when I pull into hotels, a lot of times people already know about me because people have come before me and they've told the story of this crazy thing that they saw. And so like I'll pull into a hotel and everybody's really excited to see me. And this hotel, um, is a very famous hotel. It was in Barranquilla uh, maybe a week ago, and um, it's a five-star hotel. It was actually recommended, which I thought was pretty amazing. I personally can't imagine telling, recommending a five-star hotel without letting people know it's a five-star hotel, um, but it was a phenomenal experience, and this guy was was great, and I actually celebrated my 60th birthday there, so you know, I did it in style. Yeah. Very nice. Let's go to the next picture. And as we do, uh, quickly, just to let uh, Trey and uh, and Lars know, uh, Doug is with us. I think he's working on getting on here. So uh, we're going to continue with the plan as we had it before. So we have Sylvia. We're going to go to Denny, and then we're going to go to Doug. So, all right, Sylvia. Now, uh, another interesting encounter with a, a, a police officer, looks like. What was this? Yeah, I've had really wonderful, wonderful experiences with the police. I mean, they just have just pulled out, you know, the red carpet for me. Uh, these guys, you know, first of all, they saw me and it was like a police checkpoint. So they're um, like rope across. So I had to really slow down. Um, you know, I've never been pulled over to look at anything, but they do get pretty excited. And these guys offered me water. And I thought, you know, great, some nice cold water, that would be great. And uh, when I pulled over, they um, signed a scarf for me and has the insignia of their police group. And so five policemen signed it for me and, and gave it to me as a gift. It was just really, well, it was just a really, really fun encounter. Yeah, really we've, enjoyed that. We've got a comment from Room 360. Bike Touring Pro made a tour through Columbia, too, last year, and he was very pleased with the country as well, he says. So that's uh, that's interesting to see. All right, let's go to the next one. I think we have more police involvement here with you. Yeah. <laughs> this was on my way to the fancy hotel in Barranquilla, and, of course, like my first flat of the trip is when I have a police escort and these guys like pulled up next to me. I had pulled over on the side of the road to check my map and just get a route to the hotel that was recommended. And these guys pulled up two police um, policemen on motorcycles and they said, you know, what are you doing? Where are you going? And I showed them my route on Google and they said, oh no, 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 you cannot go that way. Um, it's too dangerous. And so we will give you a police escort. And while we were, uh, riding together, I got a flat, of course, on my rear wheel. Of which course, I on never, your rear wheel, yeah. Uh, right, of course. And it's the first time that I've changed a rear wheel flat since I had the roll-off installed. And that was like, 
a year and a half ago, maybe years ago. And, you know, like, sure, I, I got the instructions on how to do it, but, you know, until you've actually uh, had the opportunity on the road to, to do it, it's, it's totally different. And of course, how could I, you know, I just couldn't even remember, but it took us a lot. Um, it took us a long time. It was quite the project. Uh, but luckily I had these guys to help me and, uh, we, it turned into a really fun adventure. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Next pick. Oh, oh, what's this? What? Oh, thank you, you guys. So uh, many of you who follow Sylvia know that she celebrated a, uh, a momentous birthday. We won't say which one, but uh, it was yeah. this past week, I believe. So we wanted to wish you a very happy birthday. And we're glad to be able to celebrate that thank with you. you here on the Layback Black Report. So, <laughs> yeah. That's very, very nice. Thank you. All right. We won't dwell on that because I know you don't want to. I want to uh, finish <laughs> up with you talking about uh, something that you've been thinking about for a while. We've chatted a little bit about it. You are thinking about making some changes in the way that you tour. Um, yeah. And I, I starting, I guess, maybe with the next tour. Uh, talk to us a little bit about what, uh, what you have in mind here. What's been going on with this? You know, I've been thinking about adding electric assist for at least two years. And I just, I'm still on the fence. It's like, should I, shouldn't I, you know, it's such a, big commitment and there are additional issues. Um, but for me, um, the reason why I'm thinking about it is I'm just such a slow cyclist that I always travel alone. Um, you know, I'm just, it's, my speed is just too slow to ride with other people. And so I keep thinking that, you know, if I add e-assist, um, you know, it will give me the opportunity to ride with other people. And um, I keep thinking like, you know, that's, that's something that I would like to be able to do. Yeah. Okay. So, and that's going to involve some more complications to how you do things. Yes. Yeah. You know, the biggest problem with e-assist for me is you can't take the batteries on the plane. And so, um, you know, I could do a tour where I leave from, you know, the house in Portland, you know, maybe go down the coast and ride into Mexico and do a round trip. And, and that would be great. But then I think like, so what do I do for the next tour? And how, you know, if I want to go to Ecuador, how do I make that happen? And, you know, maybe I just keep my current trike and, you know, if I want to go someplace far away, I'll you know, just go back to uh, a non, you know, non e-assist trike. So these are things I kind of have to think about and um, decide if that's if, if that's going to be okay. And let's yeah. throw that out to our viewers too, because there's a lot of folks watching who may have some ideas about how to uh, go about doing what you want to do in terms of flying with the batteries or transporting them in other ways. These are all the things I know you're thinking about. So uh, yeah, if you're out there watching manufacturers or guys with some ideas about this, I'm sure Sylvia would love to hear from you about some suggestions you might have for her on that. So um, fair to say, Sylvia, I don't mean to be putting words in your mouth. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'm up. Yeah, I, okay. I'm, I'm still like thinking about it. All right. Let's let's finish up uh, with uh, how you're going to finish up this tour. I, I don't know really that I know what the what, what is the final destination here for you? How long are you still going to be in Columbia when you're heading back to Portland? Yeah, I extended my visa, and I think I think it's until like maybe April fifteenth or twenty. And so um, I'm in Cartagena right now, and I'm going to be here for t for two weeks. I'm living with a family, and I'm going to be studying Spanish. And then from here, I'm going to ride um, to a huge, huge lake area and a small pueblo called Santa Cruz de Monpox. It's a colonial city that I think you can only get to by boat. Um, and then from there, I'm going to ride to Medellin and then that's where I'm going to finish up. Um, so, um, so and Medellin is another just, you know, beautiful colonial historic city and it's much higher in the mountains. Um, so I'll probably want to spend um, at least a week there, but you know, I think I've got about five, five weeks left for this tour. Yeah. Oh. And then I'll fly to LA. Okay, sounds great. I am so glad that we had a chance to catch up with you again on uh, this tour. I hope we will continue to do that. Uh, maybe we'll get a chance to see you sometime uh, before this fall. If not, maybe we'll be heading back to Portland and see you again there. In any case, well, Sylvia, I love that. It, it's, you know, I thank you. It. 
Thank you. It's it's a pleasure as always to have you on the show. You're welcome to stick around to the end here if you like. And folks, if Great. you want to, uh, for the two or three of you out there who don't know how to contact Sylvia or read her stuff, she's all on Facebook. She's got the uh, YouTube channel and her blog, Travels by Trike, right? That's it. Yep. We'll have the links uh, down below for you guys That's to nice. follow Thank her. You. Please do. She's a great person to follow. Very interesting. Sylvia, have a good one. We will talk to you soon. All right. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, everybody. Okay. You bet. All right. Uh, at this point, folks, I think it's time for the sports. So, uh, Denny, you about ready to go? Yeah, I am. You got me okay, Gary? I'm going to throw it over to you. Take it away, Danny. Okay, you just threw it over to me. First, uh, this just in, and then we got this off Bent Rider, so I'm I'm not, uh, hasn't been quite verified, but the one-hour trike record's probably been broken. Lyle uh, Lyrich made uh, an attempt today on the open record currently held by Ned Volk at 44.152 kilometers per hour. That's 27 point. Uh, four, three, five miles per hour for us Imperial people. And Kyle rode a uh, Phantom Trikes carbon chassis trike. Uh, his He broke the record uh, pending ratification, and it looks like it's going to be very close to 50 kilometers per hour. Quite interesting. It was uh, uh, one of the uh, achievable records, but one that they haven't been uh, too many tries on. So good, uh, good there. Um, first off, uh, as far as the ultra racing goes this week, is uh, the Pace Bend Ultra was run on a hilly course run on smooth asphalt. This is a chip timed, non drafting road event featuring 6, 12, and 24 hour marathon style races at P Pace Bend Park, located 30 minutes west of Austin, Texas. This year, there were only two recumbents challenging the 24 hour course. Steve Timmons logged an impressive 254 miles, and Dan Fallon finished the 24 hours with 117 miles. Danny, <clears throat> if I could, just real briefly here, we've got an update from uh, Mike Mowat, who is the stats guy. Ah. And he says that uh, Kyle Irich, uh, it was, <laughs> this is important, I guess, 49.508 kilometers was uh, was his record. So. Well, there you go. I see that over on the sidebar. Yep, thanks, yep. Gary. So, thanks. Go and, ahead. I'm and, sorry. And thanks, Mike, too, for uh, mm -hmm. clearing that up. Um, where was I? Oh, yeah. Bike Sebring is uh, next, and this race is held the second week in February with all racers starting on the famous Sebring Florida race road race track. The 12- and 24-hour race also finished in this historic racing facility. Recumbents are welcome and no strangers to winning here. Uh, with some of the best recumbent cyclists in the country participating, the 100-mile race was dominated by the cruise bike contingent. First place was Carl Ly Kyle Larson with an impressive time of four hours and seven minutes, uh, 40 seconds. Uh, Alex Truhall was just seven seconds behind to claim second place. And rounding out third place was Jim Parker, the CEO of Cruise Bike, eight minutes behind and four minutes uh, ahead of fourth place Daniel Cello. Uh, and, yeah, for, ahead of fourth place Daniel Cello. Uh, had a top 10 finish in the HPV, finishing sixth overall. <clears throat> uh, in the 12-hour race, uh, the other Parker at Sebring, Maria finished first among the women with 246.4 miles, finishing fifth overall uh, of all the 12-hour racers in a very impressive showing. Uh, in other results, veteran ultra cyclist Craig Prather did 223 miles in a Velomobile, his first race on a Velo platform. Mark Swanson, CEO of Bichetta, was on hand to ride the new Bichetta Carbon Trike 2.0 prototype. He and Jeff Ritter managed to log 174 miles. The other recumbent competitors were Robert Thorne, Dave Towns, and returning to the ultra scene after a couple of years of dealing with injuries, Alan Doom. In the 24-hour drafting race, Scotty Seagart did 234 miles, good for an overall ninth place finish. Uh, in the 24-hour non-drafting Ram qualifier, Kent Polk was a top recumbent with an eighth-place overall finish and qualified for Ram with 437 miles. Other recumbent riders were John Harthoon, Gary Alexander, Robert Page, Ed Bernsky, uh, Larry Osland, and Jason New. This year was a good showing of recumbents and eighth HPV racers. Overall, the number of competitors was up from last year, a good sign for ultra racing events in this coming year. 
That's it for this month. Remember to stay on the bike and keep moving forward. Back to you, Gary. I will keep that in mind, Denny. Thank you so much for that great sports report. Folks, uh, I believe we are in luck because uh, if you can unmute yourself, Doug, let's see if we can hear you okay. Yeah, he's trying. You Doug, are you there? Yeah, can we can. Me? Unbelievable. That? <laughs> Is that your van? Uh, yeah, the back of my van. I'm All right. Now. I just took a break from the ride and uh, thought I'd ch check in with you here, Gary. Uh, all right. Let me introduce you a little bit more properly. And I appreciate uh, you being on. I know this is not easy. Folks, that's Doug Davis right there, regular on our show. Uh, Doug, your finger is in front of the lens there or something is. Oh, well, there you go. Course. I just want to. Yeah. There you go. I want him to see you, <laughs> you know, fully. So uh, as many of you know, come on back to me, if you would, uh, Lars, for just a minute so I can introduce him properly. Um, uh, right. So Trey and I uh, traveled uh, to Plano, Texas uh, earlier this month uh, to participate in what was to be the grand opening of a, uh, a new recumbent shop, very special one that was going to specialize in Velomobiles. So if you've uh, watched uh, this show at all recently, you'll know that Doug is, uh, as his retirement project, decided to open a, a recumbent shop and he has always had a lot of Velomobiles and he wanted to specialize in bringing in Velomobiles uh, from all over the world that people could go to a shop and ride in. So. Um, it was a very exciting development. So many people uh, were interested in knowing more about this. We went to uh, Plano. We uh, met with Doug, saw the shop as it was being put together. Uh, as many of you know, uh, things got a little behind schedule, as they often do when you uh, open something new. Um, but he was diligently working away and putting things up and getting things ready. He had a number of automobiles and recumbents on hand. So uh, Doug, uh, Trey and I were there, uh, shot a lot of video that is going to be uh, uh, one of the first videos that we uh, crank out from many that we have shot over the last month. And you'll be able to see uh, in-depth interviews with uh, Doug and, uh, and all the things that are going on. But we wanted to uh, give you at least a taste of what went on and what's going on right now at Bicycle Evolution. So Doug, who is riding in the pack tour right now, uh, took time off of his ride so he can uh, he can uh, guide us a little bit better through the slideshow. Uh, so that's where we are right now. Doug Davis, welcome to the Laid Back Bike Report officially. <laughs> Thanks, Gary. All right, bud. We, let's uh, let's get that uh, slideshow cranked up if we could. And uh, and uh, I will just start by saying uh, this was the very uh, beginning of our uh, <laughs> our look at bicycle evolution. There weren't much in the way of uh, of accoutrements there. Even the official sign wasn't up yet, but we had this. So we wanted to start talking about what we could see. And that was it. Next slide. And uh, just to bring you guys update updated. Um, we saw, I think yesterday or the day before, Doug had posted uh, a much nicer looking sign. I think that is uh, a very cool looking sign, Doug. More, so more I'm glad. I'm guessing you're glad to have that up. <laughs> yeah, that was the, that was the first thing we ordered and the last thing to come in the shop. So there you go. Right. Okay. Um, you know what? I am going to try to boost your audio a little bit here because it's a little quiet. Let me let me do that if I can. Uh, da, 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 da. Let's see. Well, well, I don't know why I can't find you. Can you? Okay. Or just speak a little bit louder. I'm not finding you on here. Okay. No matter. Um, so let's go to the next slide. And uh, Doug, I'm going to kind of turn it over to you if you would. This is early on, obviously. What? Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, what went into getting this thing put together. So, you know, we were we were trying to figure out how to stack bikes, trikes, velomobiles. We found some bike racks. They weren't quite right, so we, we modified a bunch of them. Uh, you know, we, 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 we've come up with a concept we think works with the velomobiles below the, the bikes and trikes. Uh, the store is a little bit different now. We've got carpet in, different carpet than what you saw, because uh, what you saw was from the original flooring. So we got there. We've got another set of racks uh, that have been built since before, since you guys came in. So we've got space for, I guess, about 30 more trikes and bikes uh, now rackable. So and so in total, we've got uh, room for 25 velomobiles, of which we have 20 now. Uh, you guys saw some pictures of them coming in. 
and uh, we have room for about 50 trikes and bikes of different sizes and shapes. And so Let's we're, slide on to the next one here. Yeah, yeah, we're getting there's a uh, a Wah Velomobile with uh, another Wah behind it, and then a Moose sign behind that. Uh, so we've got most of the Velomobiles in now. Uh, you guys missed by only 24 hours the 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 DF from Inner City Bike coming in. So those all right. Came there was in. a delay because I, I think because of the government shutdown and stuff involved. Yeah. Uh, so so that was that everything was really well planned out so that the floor would come in first, then the bikes, then the soft goods, then the, then the parts, then the then the shelving and stuff for the parts, and then the government shut down and of course everything came out of customs the opposite direction. So the small parts came in first, the clothing, then the bike and then the racks, then finally the floor. So. Who's that guy standing up in the back? I don't think I have a separate picture of him. We need to talk about that. Uh, I don't know. I can't see. Isn't that Richard, I think? I think so. <laughs> I can't see. With Yeah, I think that's Richard, Richard Wharton. Richard Wharton ran a business for years uh, called Cycling Center Dallas, where they did a lot of indoor coaching and outdoor coaching. And uh, as part of the Bicycle Evolution family, we purchased uh, Cycling, Cycling Center Dallas and have expanded it. It has multiple locations now. Uh, and and it'll be part do... of it'll be part of your your total solution. I know we'll yeah, talk about correct. that in a minute. I do have a slide and I just wanted to get Richard okay. in there. Next slide, sure. please. And there we are. That's uh, that's Doug and me uh, sitting side by side in Velmobiles <laughs> having yeah. a chat. Yeah, that's, that's that, that was the that was the official company furniture for a while. That's right. There wasn't too many other places to sit. So, all right. And then uh, we started talking, as I said earlier, guys, uh, uh, Doug and I, about what his plans were as far as getting everything together. And we do have this extensive interview uh, on tape, and we will get that put out as a YouTube video here very shortly. Let's go on to the next one here. And uh, your store manager, that's Greg. That's Greg Mitchell, yes. And he's, uh, he's, he's, a, he's a recovering roadie. So we're working. Yes, on that's here. right. You're working on him, aren't you? All right. 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 And there's a better shot of uh, as the best is when we were there anyways, what you had. That's right. It's a little different, but it's close to what the concept was. We got a few more squeezed in there now. All right. And next. And uh, yeah, so Doug and I went through and talked about all the different things. That's kind of a special trike there. You want to mention that real briefly? Doug? Yeah, so that's that's the older brother of the Bichetta carbon tri trike. That's actually the original, uh, my original sweet, uh, uh, Swedish uh, carbon trike that I bought, oh, about two and a half years ago now, right when they first came out, because I really wanted a, a lightweight trike. And uh, I won a lot of the like senior Olympic and time trial events with that trike and uh we've got it in the store and mainly i've got it in there for people to ride uh as a kind of a demo of what the uh Bichetta trike will look like because as we know Bichetta licensed the uh, carbon trike design right and trey and i were there visiting Bichetta a week or so ago and we're uh we got lots of video to show you guys about that i did get a chance to test drive the new one as well we will talk we're about that later go. The wall there. yeah so we're taking a closer look <laughs> at the wow we we looked at all the major brands that that doug had there at the time on the outside we talked about it and then next slide i think maybe we have a shot yeah and we went inside yeah, and doug get, did a really nice explanation of uh for those of you who haven't ridden velomobiles what in the world goes on inside those things and 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 uh, how they're put together we have a really great video of that for you to see too go ahead next one and uh, there i am looking inside to see what was there that's uh that's a Quattrovello there, and uh, I got a chance to uh, ride that. I, I didn't ride it barefooted. I actually put on Doug's shoes uh, to ride it. There I am in it, and I think the next shot, yeah. So at that point, Trey and I actually took off and uh, and did a test ride uh, on that Quattrovello, did uh, rode the streets and uh, went to a park, rode some of the trails. We got uh, about 10 miles or so in, really a fun ride. There's Trey, uh, always serious uh, <laughs> about his work with the videography. Uh, next shot, I can't stand to look at that too long. Uh, uh, coming back, I was a little wild on the steering, I'll admit. Uh, Doug was flying out of the way, trying not to get run over. Uh, next shot. And uh, there were a couple of rides that, uh, and I'll have Doug talk about this. There were a couple of rides that we got to see take off from, uh, from Bicycle Evolution uh, that weekend. Doug, this was the first one. Tell us about it. 
Yes, yeah, so we 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 have uh, uh, what was originally called the East Side Ride, which is part of the two clubs in Dallas that had combined to have a kind of a a social ride, which over the over the last maybe half half decade or so has kind of been taken over by the recumbent riders. And so there's 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 actually three rides that leave the store now. There's the there's this ride. Uh, which is a mixture of, of recumbent and upright riders. There's a, another mostly road bike riders. Uh, and then there's a volumobile group that's now leaving for the store. And so we, we we'll call it uh, socially slow, not so slow. And where did they go? <laughs> and by the way, folks, I'm going to back up one, if you would, real quick, uh, Trey. Uh, that's Jeff Bishop. He was on the show, the guy with the crazy hats and the Velomobile build. And he is crazy about all kinds of bikes, including Velomobiles, which he just has to have one. And he's working with Doug, I think, uh, on some stuff there, if I'm right. Uh, is that right, Doug? Yes, he is. Okay. And then, uh, yeah, so more of, uh, there's that, uh, there's that uh, carbon trike uh, that, uh, was that Greg riding that that day? Yeah, yeah, Greg's kind of fallen in love with my trike. <laughs> okay, next one. Yeah, and there they were out. And we got lots of great shots of the Velomobiles uh, out riding that day. And uh, and this was a separate ride, I guess. This was the next day. Yeah, this was uh, next tell day us about this Dallas ride, the Super Bowl so ride. A, yeah, this is a traditional Dallas ride. Uh, I don't think it happens in any other city, although I, I might be wrong. But we've had this ride, gosh, as long as I can remember, where uh, it's un, unofficial. Nobody sponsored it. Nobody, nobody has a... Uh, uh, you know, a, 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 a dealer or a program for it. It's basically everybody gets together and we all ride downtown the the, uh, the Super Bowl on Sunday, Super Bowl Sunday. And the reason that started that, that I recall is somewhat folklore was back when Dallas had an actual football team, uh, the streets would clear out. And so the few hours before the Super Bowl, you could be guaranteed almost a car free experience. And yeah, and that's a great way to roll. So, all right, um, Doug, uh, the last one here uh, is I don't know who that guy is, but uh, uh, the, the fitness that center that Gary, that was torturing Gary time. <laughs> the fitness center that you talked about that uh, that Richard Wharton uh, is in charge of. Uh, we visited that with our cameras, and uh, yeah, they strapped me into Doug's P thirty eight, put me on some rollers and tried to see if they could make that my very last video ever. Um, I turned a shade of red that I didn't know I was capable of turning uh, and, and and produced uh, nearly 25 watts. I believe that yeah, was the number. I but think it was tw 23 or 24. I'm not okay, sure. so uh, was, I'm not quite. Anyways, uh, the video also will be part of Doug's video <laughs> when I was there. It was a lot of fun. Those guys are a blast to work with. So uh, stay tuned for that video, as I said. I think that is... Yeah, and then we, and that that was it from Bicycle Evolution. Uh, I want at this point, Doug, if we could wrap it up. I I just wanted you to bring us up to date, if you could, since uh, it's been three or so weeks since we were there. Uh, tell us. Uh, w I know you've got more inventory in. Uh, tell us a little bit more about uh, what the latest is on Bicycle Evolution. Well, we're, we're, we have a sign now. Uh, we have carpet now. Those are two things that have drastically improved since you were there. Uh, we have more bikes, more tracks, more velomobiles. Um, we have more velomobiles in the air now, even as I speak. Uh, I think we are now up to 16 or 17 rideable velomobiles, meaning they're not just somebody who's ordered there. Uh, we've what does about... a person do, Doug, if, I'm, if I've watched uh, and read a numerous accounts of Velomobiles and I'm kind of interested, or I have one and I want another one, I've seen a few of those guys, how do I go about contacting you to make an appointment, or how does that all work? Well, they're like Doritos. You can't have just what you can't eat just but one. <laughs> uh, but uh, right now, so our website's got an, an, an intake form on it. Uh, our website should be up to date. Uh, I went through it last night, uh, found some more errors in it, so we're working through that today, or hopefully we will. Uh, but before that, you can just call us, and we can schedule, get you on the calendar. We ask you a couple of questions because we want to make sure we can set them up for you because Velomobiles, like recumbents, you have to do a little bit of sizing for them. So we'll ask you things like your height and your weight and your shoe size and, and blood type and things like that to make sure that the insurance can cover you. I mean, uh, and so we can... Uh, get you scheduled. Uh, Greg and myself both do test rides. Uh, we have, as you mentioned earlier, a huge trail system that is right next to the store that you can ride around on. And we have open roads with nice, friendly traffic that we ride on all the time. Very, very good. Uh, uh, Trey, if you can back up one, I think I had the slide. Yeah, and hit him. 
could you hit that slide for us, please, uh, Lars? Thank you. So uh, there is uh, the email uh, address, if you like, and uh, and I will I will post that, of course, in the description below. And I know that uh, website's going to be up and running here very shortly as well. Doug, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I, I appreciate you uh, going out of your way, stop your ride to, to come on with us today. Uh, we will be in I touch shortly and I will get that video done. out shortly too. Anything <laughs> anything uh, to wrap up? I don't want to cut you off. No, no, but, no, I was saying I was just climbing hills. It was nothing. It's an absolutely gorgeous day out here today. It was when we drove in, it was snowing in Tucson. Uh, it was it was it, it, it was something else to behold because it never snows in Tucson, and now it's about 55, 60 degrees, no wind, and absolutely blue skies. And I'm glad I'm out doing this rather than than working. But, uh, <laughs> well, that will but only I, last so long, Doug. Yeah, unfortunately, I, you know, I made a promise to myself that I would keep my writing up even if I started this thing, and so far I've been able to break my promise pretty much every week. But uh, I'm I'm still trying. Very good. All right, bud, you get back out there, have hey, some fun. Thank you for uh, showing sorry up. To interrupt. So, so, somebody oh, yeah. was asking in the chat about the carbon trike. Uh, well, I can't see the chat, so if you read it to me, I might be able to answer it. <laughs> what was it, uh, Larry? Uh, I, I'm sorry, I should. Yeah, what, asked, what was the car? Oh, the, the one that asked what was the carbon trike? Yeah. Okay, so uh, yeah, it, it go ahead, Doug. Re remind them again. It, so, so that is that is an original carbon trike from the company called CarbonTrikes.com. It was made in, in Sweden, uh, and that is the licensed design that Bachetta is following. Uh, Bachetta's made some improvements. I've ridden both now, uh, and I would say that the Bachetta design is a little improved. So uh, I, I think that that's a you know a, a fantastic trike. But we have the carbon trike now which we've been riding around and letting people try because it's really close. It's just the older brother. Uh, the improvements are nothing but good. So, uh, you know, we've, we've suggested to people if they want to feel this, if they're about to make a decision and they're not sure and they're waiting, come ride this trike. You can feel, every, you know, 99% of what the carbon trike is going to be like that Machetta produces. Uh, and so you'll you, you'll have a pretty good idea of, of what this thing will be like, whether or not you want to wait for it or not, because there are other trikes out there and we have plenty of other ones. We have lots of other fast trikes. Very good. Thanks for the update on that, Doug. We appreciate it. We will talk soon. And folks, we need to move along here. I want to uh, once again point out the uh, amazing folks who sponsor this show every month. And we're going to start out with TerraCycle. From fairings to headrests, whatever accessory you need, Pat and crew have you covered. And trailside.bike. If you find yourself in Florida near the Withlacoochee Trail, stop in and see Andrew and his crew. We just did. Andrew will help you out. He's a great guy down there. And cruise bike. Their patented race and record-proven front-wheel drive geometry changes the rules of cycling. Now, comfort doesn't come at the cost of performance. But fair warning, your cheeks may hurt from smiling. And lightning cycles, surprising speed, comfort, and agility featuring the superior climbing quality that you've been looking for. Check out lightning recumbents today. All right, folks, let's get to the announcements. We've got uh, plenty to talk about here. Uh, I'm going to talk about what's coming up first, and then we'll talk about what we have been doing. First of all, this Thursday, uh, we are leaving uh, for uh, Texas again uh, in the Fort Worth area, March 1st through 3rd. So Friday through Sunday uh, of this year is the Hot Rally. Uh, the Hot Rally is put on by Easy Street Recumbents, as you probably know. And it is going to be really fun. I just got the schedule yesterday to see. This is one of the more uh, crazy activity uh, rallies you'd ever want to attend. There are rides, of course, but there's also rodeos. And the Texas Trike Shootout is going to be featured. Uh, Bachetta and Ice Trikes are going to be there uh, with uh, the VTX and the CT 2.0 we were just talking about respectively. And there's going to be a shootout in that there's going to be lots of people uh, racing uh, those two against each other. Uh, and then I think they're going to do some sort of um, tallying at the end and decide who wins the shootout. But it's all in, it's all in good fun. And uh, we're looking forward to seeing our friends from ICE and our buddies from Bichetta, uh there. 
Also, uh, Tice from Catrike will be attending, and Catrike is going to be offering up a new EOLA uh, for the raffle. So uh, I don't think these are even really out yet. So if you are looking for an EOLA and you want one before the official release, this is the way to do it. Uh, that is a great prize, and we look forward to seeing our pal uh, Tice there uh, from Catrike. Uh, yeah, so rides, games, rodeo, other sorts of uh, hijinks that Mike puts on there at Easy Street. Uh, it should be a lot of fun. And I, uh, my understanding is that it is still open. They have, I, I think they allow 100 uh, participants, and they have not filled yet. So uh, if you are like uh, my pal Larry Seidman, who is on the show here, uh, and want to go but haven't signed up yet, do it. Larry, do it. You know, you just quit waiting. Uh, okay, uh, and of course, uh, most importantly, the laid back bike report is going to be there. Trey and I are on the road again with our wives, I think, this time, and uh, we're going to be covering it all, shooting lots of video. So if you can't make the rally, uh, hopefully you will be able to uh, see what goes on during our videos. All right, um, if you could come back to me here, we'll get to uh, we'll get to Susan's uh, book in a minute. Uh, I want to, uh, the next announcement has to do with uh, what Trey and I have been doing on the road uh, and what's going to come of it. So we've talked uh, about this kind of a roundabout, but I want to uh, I want to uh, single all these things out. We started out in Colorado Springs. Uh, actually, Larry Seidman was there with me and we shot a video at uh, Angle Tech and uh, interviewed Kelvin Clark there. Uh, we did a nice uh, test ride uh, with an uh, Azub uh, TieFly uh, X and uh, rode through the Garden of the Gods, one of the more beautiful places you'd ever want to ride. So we had a great time at Angle Tech. Thanks, Kelvin, for uh, showing us around. Lots of video there. Uh, then we went to Plano, Texas, uh, saw Doug, uh, Bicycle Evolution, rode the Quattrovello, as uh, we just talked about. And then uh, we got home for a few days and then left uh, for part south. We uh, drove down uh, heading towards Florida, but before we got there, we stopped in Lincolnton, uh, North Carolina the home of Trident Trikes. And we stopped to uh, visit our pal, uh, Tom Floor. And uh, Tom gave us a nice, uh, a nice uh, tour of the Trident Trikes uh, shop, which is beautiful. Uh, it, it's a, a restored old uh, uh, seed uh, warehouse, but uh, really cool. A rail trail runs right behind it. We did a little test ride on a, on a terrain, uh, and it was a lot of fun. So thank you for inviting us there, Tom. Video to follow, of course. Uh, then down to Florida, we stopped in Floral City, uh, where uh, where Denny is right now. Actually, just a mile or so away is uh, uh, Trailside uh, Bike, and we visited with Andrew uh, Blankenship there. Uh, he threw a barbecue uh, in on, in our honor and his customers' honor. It was really a lot of fun uh, getting to know them. Shot lots of video there. You'll get a tour of uh, Trailside. Then we went on to visit our good friends, John and Jackie uh, Schlitter uh, in Spring Hill, Florida. I uh, had a nice chat uh, with them, especially John. And as many of you know, they're going to be moving their shop to uh, Tampa uh, and kind of downsizing that shop a bit. John has got some very interesting things in development uh, that we cannot talk about just yet, but you stay tuned on that and uh, you're going you're gonna to be excited, I think. Uh, then down to St. Petersburg, Florida, where we uh, met up um, with uh, Mark Swanson and uh, Mike Wilkerson, who uh, uh, showed us some really nice hospitality at their shop uh, at Bichetta and uh, got to ride, as I mentioned earlier, the new version of that CT 2.0, the carbon trike. Uh, Lars uh, from Sweden was one of the originators of the carbon trike. Uh, uh, was there and he he is continuing to help uh, tweak that design until it's ready to go uh, I think in May uh, so that uh, was really fun and you we've shot lots of video of that and me test riding that thing uh, and Trey coming along shooting some great video there so I hope you'll like that and then to Orlando was our uh, our last stop on the trip uh, cat trike uh, I tell you what folks that is an amazing factory uh, Mark Eglin uh, and Tice were there to greet us and show us around. We got a great tour of the factory, got to see how everything is made, shot lots of video of every station in the factory. Uh, you will get to see how they make cat trikes. 
really, really fun stuff. So we'll try to get that out as, as quickly as we can. And I even got to ride uh, the new version of the 700, which was kind of fun. So lots of new video uh, coming in the in the next few weeks. So we hope you guys will keep uh, hope you guys will keep uh, an eye open for that. We will post those as quickly as uh, we can. All right, let me see here. Shout outs. Uh, yeah, let's go to that uh, next slide. Uh, while we are at uh, Trailside in uh, Trailside Bikes in in Florida. We had uh, the pleasure of meeting Susan Straley, who I think might still be with us on chat. Uh, Susan uh, has written this amazing book, uh, Alzheimer's Trippin' with George. Um, it is the story of she and her husband's uh, travels uh, as he continued his journey through uh, the Alzheimer's uh, um, disease that he had to uh, that he had to deal with. So, and she did as well, obviously. Uh, I have not read the book. She just gave it to me while we were there and I've been kind of busy. Uh, it is filled with, uh, with pick here, uh, come to me for a second, Lars, if you would. I actually have the amazing uh, copy that she gave me here. It is for real. Uh, lots of great pictures of their journeys as well. Um, really interesting book uh, from what I can see so far. I will read that. And we will, uh, I haven't got an answer yet from her, but we are going to have Susan on. So if you uh, folks want to go to Amazon and uh, pick up a copy, uh, uh, read it, and then we'll have Susan on to uh, chat with you about the book. Lots of interesting subjects to discuss there. So Susan Straley. Okay. Uh, the uh, the next uh, shout out I have is has to do with uh, Angelica and Panagiota, uh, a couple that my wife met at Angletech when she went there. I had left my camera or no, my microphone behind uh, after I had left uh, Colorado Springs and uh, Marilyn went there to pick it up. And she met these two nice ladies that were uh, in the parking lot there at Angle Tech and talked about some of the things they were doing, including uh, the new trikes that they had bought. Um, I believe that's Angelica there. Uh, they uh, took a, a short tour on these trikes and plan to do more extensive tours. Now, you can see that Azub right there with uh, that yellow kind of looking bag at the top. Well, if you look closely on the next shot, you will see what is in that? Yep, uh, some kind of parrot. I'm probably it's probably not a parrot. I'm sure you will let us know what it is. But uh, Angelica uh, commutes to work on that trike and brings uh, that bird with her. I believe it's heated so that even though she's traveling uh, in the cold this time of year, that bird apparently just loves to ride on the trike. So um, we want to shout out to Angelica and Panagiota and thank them for talking with my wife and sharing a little bit of their story. Uh, with those trikes. And you can see the continue to upgrade them with um, with canopies and a, a solar powered canopy on that, uh, on that one as well. So uh, thanks, Angelica and Panagiota. Uh, all right, uh, folks. Uh, yeah, so that is our uh, shout out segment. And if, uh, if you'd like uh, to see uh, something that you've done, uh, an event that you've attended, a tour that you've taken, or a bike or trike that you have that you want to share the story uh, of with us, uh, contact uh, me at laidbackbikereport at gmail.com. And uh, we'll see if we can't get some pictures from you and share it uh, with all of our viewers. Uh, we love to do that kind of stuff. What is coming up on the next Laid Back Bike Report, you might ask? Well, we have uh, David Branderberger. Uh, many of you may know him as the guy who started the Solo Trike Project. He is the Swiss adventurer who is traveling around the world in this trike and, um, and, and trailer setup, uh, solar powered, as you can see there. He is currently in uh, Australia. Uh, when, uh, uh, during our last show, when we were talking with uh, the Pedal Pre folks from Adelaide, he was there, I think just pulling in. And uh, he's on his way to Melbourne. So uh, our uh, best guess right now will be March 17th uh, at 4 p.m. Uh, that might be flexible. As you know, when we uh, put together shows from Australia, the timing is always kind of 
uh, difficult, but uh, I think we'll probably stick to that. So uh, David will be on. He's such an interesting guy, musician, artist. Um, um, he is an, uh, builds these amazing uh, ways of traveling around the world. Uh, so I think you'll really enjoy uh, our chat with, uh, with David Brandenberger next month. All right, guys, I want to talk to you uh, about uh, how uh, we run the YouTube videos after uh, this goes up on YouTube and uh, how you can uh, maneuver your way around the show. Uh, all of our shows, so once they go up on YouTube, have a description below them. You'll see below the viewing screen. And they uh, the description will contain a clickable table of contents, which I always put up after the show, so that you can jump around. We had a number of guests on the show today, for instance, and if you just want to look at one, uh, or maybe you want to switch around the order in which you see them, uh, you can do that or come back and, and uh, for different helpings at different times so you don't have to watch the whole show at once. The table of contents is there for you. You just click on the uh, time link in front of uh, what you want to see, and it will go directly to that part of the show. And then below that, we have uh, links. Uh, as uh, I've mentioned many times, uh, we'll, uh, the ways to get a hold of our guests and uh, the things that they produce, books and uh, websites and blogs, uh, all those links I will list below so you can go uh, directly to them. If we talked about it, the links will be there. All right, uh, back to me if you would, great. Uh, Brian is gone, but I want to thank Brian Ball and Bent Rider for all of their promotional help to uh, us here at the Layback Bike Report. Uh, they always post our shows and uh, are a, a great friend of the Layback Bike Report. So thanks, Brian. Uh, and all the panelists who I uh, introduced earlier today uh, are of such help and do such a great job to make this show look good and move right along. Uh, sometimes they have to message me during the show to keep me moving along. So thanks guys for all of your help on the laid back bike report. All right, again, how can you help us? How about subscribing to the laid back bike report YouTube channel? Uh, right down in the lower right hand corner there, you will see the logo of the laid back bike report. Uh, click on that, go to the uh, U YouTube channel and subscribe, please. You can also uh, follow us and or like us on uh, on Facebook. Perhaps you've heard of that. Uh, so uh, go there, like us on Facebook. We, we always post things that don't necessarily make it into the show uh, on our Facebook Layback Back Report page uh, to keep you guys informed. You can also check out our website, laidbackbikereport.com. Uh, you're going to see a, a little uh, eye pop up in the upper right-hand corner. And uh, if you click that, it's going to take you right there to the website where you can uh, go to various uh, pages on our website and it will show you different things. So the, the main page has all of our sponsors, uh, not just those of our webcast, which I've told you about uh, today but all the sponsors who have supported us through our events as well. You can also find our most recent show on the front page, our upcoming shows, and then we have links to past shows, bonus material, where we put uh, all the pictures that we use on the show. You guys might wanna go through those. You'll find them there as well. And you can sign up for our mailing list, uh, which uh, I think we have 300 some members on that list. I uh, put out an email before each show and occasionally uh, other times when something of note pops up, kind of insider information, uh, sign up for our email list uh, on a website as well. And of course on our website, you can also buy a hat. Larry Varney, no one models these hats better than he does. Uh, you can uh, just, you can buy a hat on the website. Let us know, $20 plus plus five dollars shipping and handling we would appreciate that and it's all at www.laidbackbikereport.com thank you all so much for uh, watching today i hope you enjoyed uh, our many guests and uh, in, and the information that we presented to you today we had a great time uh, uh showing it to you and and being with you on the live chat uh we hope we'll see you again uh next month i think march 17th as i said so until our next webcast, from all of us here at the Laidback Bike Report, so long, bet riders.